Biohacking, it's not just about being well, it's about being more than well. It's the power to transform yourself. Are we ready? I'm Dave Asprey, and this is Biohacking. Hi, I'm Dave Asprey, the father of biohacking. This episode is all about food and nutrition so that you know what to eat to feel good all the time and maybe lose weight as a side effect. I'll teach you how to remove kryptonite, the bad stuff that's present in food, add in the good stuff, and follow an anti-inflammatory diet. You'll learn about things in your food that are specifically associated with living longer and reducing your risk of chronic diseases. Things like prebiotic fiber, antioxidants, saturated fat, which you actually need in your food, and cholesterol. Nutrition isn't just about carbs and fats and proteins. It's the type of carbs, the type of fat, and the type of protein that makes all the difference. Different proteins do different things, and you're going to learn which ones you want to eat. You need fat because it's what makes you feel full and it's what your hormones are made out of. And not all fats are created equal. Different fats have different properties. And when oxygen atoms can stick to a molecule, it can create a free electron. It's called a reactive oxygen species. And that's where inflammation comes from in your body. Some fats are more subject to that than others. Animal fats are different than plant fats. Saturated fats don't have places where oxygen can stick so they're very stable. On the other hand, polyunsaturated fats, or PUFAs, have a lot of places where oxygen molecules can stick. They're less stable, and they're not what your body is built out of. Basically, the less stable the fat that you eat is, the less stable the fat in your body is, including your white fat, which means more inflammation. So maybe you wanna shift your fats towards the ones that work better because they keep your body from being inflamed. Monounsaturated fats are less stable than saturated fats, but you still need some of those, things like olive oil. Polyunsaturated fats, like corn oil, vegetable oil, canola oil, all the nut and seed oils, the plant-based oils, for the most part, are polyunsaturated, and when you minimize those in your diet, you find that suddenly everything works again. So that's a very important point that a lot of times people don't talk about. It's high fat or low fat, it doesn't matter if you don't know what kind of fat. Although those omega-3s and omega-6s are unstable, your body needs a small amount of those, but a very small amount. And today, because they're cheaper, restaurants and big food companies feed you a lot of omega-6s, and that's behind a lot of the problems you're having right now. The best saturated fats you can eat are grass-fed tallow, butter, ghee, MCT oil, coconut oil, or, if you're not allergic, raw, full-fat dairy products. That can change your life. The good monounsaturated fats would be whole avocados, not extracted avocado oil, extra virgin olive oil, or there's a new kind of oil called cultured oil, which is highly stable and purely monounsaturated. A lot of restaurants are starting to use that. Polyunsaturated omega-3s, the things that you wanna take, are high quality krill oil, wild seafood, and you can actually get omega-3s from grass-fed beef or lamb because Fish has a lot of mercury and microplastic concerns that it didn't have 25 years ago. It turns out grass-fed ruminants are your secret weapon. When it comes to polyunsaturated omega-6s, you really want to avoid canola, soybean, sunflower, safflower, cottonseed, and peanut oils. Limit the amount of pork you eat, and chicken fat and poultry fat also is high in the kind of fat that leads to inflammation. Our Western diet has become very high in omega-6 fats over the past 30 years, right as our obesity levels went through the roof. There is so much omega-6 in the Western diet right now that you don't have to make sure you get enough. The trick is to eat as little as you can and you'll still get some no matter what. You'll even find omega-6s in foods like grass-fed beef because it's there in a couple percentage points. So yes, you need omega-6s, but not as much as you're getting. There are also artificial trans fats. These are chemically modified seed oils and you never wanna eat those. And right now, most foods in the United States have those taken out, except they leave small amounts. So if it says vegetable oils, you don't really know how much of it is trans fat. Trans fats and omega-6 fats will increase your risk of stroke, heart disease, type two diabetes, and obesity. They also change a ratio that's really important. 
Your total cholesterol isn't that well correlated with any kind of disease, but what's very important is how much HDL do you have versus LDL. Trans fats wreck the ratio so that you don't have the protective HDL. If you eat the way I'm teaching you in this episode, you'll raise your HDL levels, which are the protective kind of cholesterol. There are also studies that link artificial trans fats to various cancers, pregnancy complications, and even less brain function. And let's talk about protein. Protein is found in every part of your body. It builds and gives structure to tissues, organs, and muscles. It also forms antibodies so that you can fight off infections. It makes hemoglobin so that your blood works and it creates your hormones and so much more. Here's what you need to know about proteins. Proteins are made out of something called amino acids. You've probably heard of those on an ad somewhere. Amino acids are like letters in the alphabet. And when you string letters together to make a word, that's something called a peptide, which is a fraction of a protein. When you have a whole sentence, that's actually a piece of protein, like a piece of chicken breast or something. So you have letters, you have words, and you have sentences. And normally we eat the sentences and then our bodies break them down into peptides or amino acids. And different types of proteins have different peptides, different words that tell your body what to do. And they have different amino acids, building blocks. So if you eat a plant-based protein that's not very similar to yours, you might not have the amino acid letters you would need to build up the kind of proteins you want in your body. You want at least 20% of your total daily calories from protein. Another way of looking at that is about 30 grams of protein per meal. And this needs to be good quality protein because high quality protein comes from grass-fed beef, lamb, eggs, collagen protein, grass-fed whey concentrate, dairy if you can handle dairy, and even a small amount of organ meat. You could have a2 raw cow's milk, you could have sheep, you can have goat. You could even eat a little bit of pasteurized pork, but not too much. You wanna limit your poultry because it has too much of the bad fat. And you wanna limit your farmed seafood because it has high amounts of polychlorinated biphenols or PCBs and mercury. What you do wanna eat is bivalves, mussels, oysters, clams, or younger fish that are smaller so they have less time to build up mercury in their bodies. Wild sockeye salmon is one of the best fishes you could eat. You wanna avoid plant-based meat substitutes. And that's because they have very little protein and the protein they have comes from plants. If you were to eat 30 grams of animal-based protein, you would get the benefits of it. 30 grams of plant-based protein doesn't provide the same amino acids, the same building blocks. Big food companies will tell you that this plant protein is the same as this animal protein because protein. Plant proteins also have the problem of being high in toxic heavy metals like arsenic, brown rice protein is usually high in arsenic, and all plant proteins come packaged with anti-nutrients. These, this is how plants protect themselves from us eating them. Since they can't run away, they coat their proteins in things that inflame our bodies. You can have some plants, you eat the plants, but to concentrate those proteins instead of eating the proteins that are compatible with us isn't a great idea. And then we get to carbs. Your main source of carbs should be vegetables. The reality is that most plants are out to get you. They don't have claws or legs to run away. And if you don't believe me, if you were to go outside right now and just pick a plant from your front yard or from the forest and eat a couple bites of it, don't do this. You're gonna have profound stomach aches and could even go to the hospital. That's how plants really treat us. So the fact that something is plant-based or not plant-based, it doesn't matter. You need to know exactly what it is and what it does to you. And one of the anti-nutrients that is just running havoc across our society right now is called phytic acid. Plants use phytic acid to bind to calcium, iron, magnesium, chromium, manganese, and zinc. These are the minerals that your body needs in order to function every day. So the plants know if they steal these minerals from you, over time, they will be less humans, so therefore there can be more plants. And phytic acid creates phytate when it binds to those minerals and then your body can absorb the minerals in your diet, but it'll literally suck them from your bones and from your tissues. 
And this is why a lot of times as people age, they start breaking their hips, they start breaking their bones. We're seeing an epidemic of bone density problems even in young people because we're eating plants high in phytic acid and we're not getting enough minerals even to make enzymes. Where does phytic acid come from? Nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, whole grains, soy, corn, and most of all, oats. Your oat milk is not a good decision. In addition to osteoporosis, we're seeing an epidemic of metabolic dysfunction because when your body needs a mineral in order to make your cells make energy and the mineral just isn't there because a plant stole it because someone tricked you into eating more plants and less meat, well, you're just gonna be tired and your system won't work well and you will be metabolically dysregulated. That's exactly what happened to me when I weighed 300 pounds. The other thing that plants make is something called lectins. And lectins are something that may interfere with your absorption of minerals, but these are little proteins that stick to the types of sugars that line your joints, line your arteries. Not everyone is sensitive to every type of lectin, but most of us have some sensitivities. If you eat a food that your ancestors never ate, you're likely to have problems. If you eat a food that your ancestors have eaten for thousands of years, you're less likely to have problems. But if you're sensitive to a lectin, and lectins can come in any of those types of plants, but specifically nightshade vegetables and nuts and seeds and grains are very high in them. Those lectins can create microscopic holes in your intestinal wall. Nightshade vegetables, which is one of the largest sources of lectins that are aggressive, they make a lectin that can stick to glucosamine, which is the compound found in your joints. So if you find you always have joint pain and inflammation and sore muscles, you might want to look at whether white potatoes, eggplants, peppers, and tomatoes, and chili peppers, maybe that's kryptonite for you, but maybe it isn't kryptonite for someone else. That's one of those suspect foods. Another major problem, and something that affected me when I was a raw vegan before I learned better, is something called oxalic acid or oxalates. If you look in raw spinach, kale, rhubarb, even raw almonds, these are relatively high in oxalic acid, which when you eat it, it circulates in your blood and it finds calcium and it binds to calcium and forms tiny razor sharp crystals. And those get deposited in your joints. It's a major cause of gout. In your kidneys, it's a major cause of kidney stones today. And they can cause systemic pain in other ways. So maybe that raw spinach and raw kale smoothie or that green powder you thought because it was plant-based, it was good for you, but it may be why you get that afternoon brain fog, why your joints hurt all the time, why your muscles are always tense. Sometimes getting rid of the suspect foods makes you feel better. So what vegetables should you eat? Steamed broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, carrots, cucumbers, squash, those work for most people. And now let's talk about the other sources of starch or carbohydrate, because your body does not need to be in ketosis all the time. That is a myth. You can use ketosis to lose weight, but then you wanna have some carbs. It's not something you do for long periods of time because it breaks almost everyone's biology eventually. So where do you get your carbs without getting all those plant toxins? It, it's a major problem. Well, the best source of carbs is white rice. And white rice has the toxic, aggressive part, the brown part of the rice removed. Yes, the fiber was removed too. You ate some broccoli, you have plenty of fiber. Plantains are very good. Butternut squash is good. Sweet potato is good, unless you're very sensitive to oxalates. And the fruits that are lower in fructose, like berries, lemons, limes, and even raw honey is a good source of carbohydrate for you. The other thing that you don't hear much about these days is prebiotic fiber. So everyone's heard of fiber because of ads for Metamucil and things like that that are kind of like sawdust. There's something different called prebiotic fiber. And this is food for the good gut bacteria that you want to grow in your stomach. When you eat prebiotic fiber, you grow the good guys that produce short chain fatty acids, something like butyrate, which is shown in studies to strengthen your brain and your gut. So eat the stuff that's food for the good guys, more good guys grow, and then they make things that your body needs. That's a pretty amazing thing. In fact, there's a study in the Netherlands that showed there was a 9% reduced risk of total death for every 10 grams of prebiotic fiber in people's diets. So 10 grams is not a lot of prebiotic fiber. You can get it from food or you can even take a supplement. Prebiotic fiber is going to be found in Brussels sprouts, asparagus, even coffee if you make it with a metal filter, has prebiotic fiber. Chocolate has prebiotic fiber. 
And I think you should consider using a prebiotic fiber in a powder form because it makes it very easy. And then you know you've always got food for the good guys. That alone could shift your weight. There are other food toxins that are part of my diet plan because some of us are more sensitive than others. And one of the big ones is histamine. And we've all heard of histamine because you take Benadryl as an antihistamine. We all hear about allergies. But histamine is a signaling molecule in the body that says get inflamed because there's a threat. Well, bacteria in food make histamine. So some foods, when they start to break down, even just leftovers overnight in the fridge, things like fish or pork or soy, overnight leftovers can have histamine because the bacteria got going and the bacteria are making histamine so that we won't eat them. If you eat a food that's high in histamine, it's going to trigger your own body's allergic response. And many people, especially post pandemic, if they're dealing with long COVID or any other things like that, people have had toxic mold, those high histamine foods are seriously a problem. And you eat one, you get brain fog, you get itchy, you cough, your nose runs, and you can even become inflamed to get muffin top from that. So knowing this may be in your food helps you know why that food created that feeling in you. One of the reasons that people get sensitive to histamine in food is because they don't make enough DAO, which is the enzyme that breaks down histamine. And you could test yourself by eating a bunch of histamine rich foods and seeing how you feel. It's easy, cook some fish, let it sit in the fridge for two days and then eat it. You also could just eat fish sauce. You could have smoked meat. You could have shellfish and leftovers or soy sauce, which is also very high in histamine. If you get heartburn, runny nose, nausea, coughing, sinus issues, itchy skin, rashes, sensitivity to light, inability to sleep, brain fog, you can take the DAO enzyme as a supplement, or you could even take a small piece of a Benadryl capsule if you know you've been exposed. My goal is that when you're done eating a meal, you feel better than before you ate the meal and you don't get a crash and a sugar craving a half hour or an hour later. And sometimes knowing about histamine is the trick. The other problem that's in food and something I'm very well known for because I made a coffee that was free of toxic mold is that mold toxins are common in our food supply. Aflatoxins are the most famous ones. They can cause DNA damage and liver cancer in humans. In fact, it's the most cancer causing substance we've found so far. It's made by mold that grows on peanuts and wheat. Common sources of mycotoxins include grains, corn, peanuts, nuts, coffee, chocolate, and beer and wine. In the US and Canada, there are no limits on mold toxins found in coffee, even though in Japan and China and Europe, there are limits. So sometimes the world's lowest quality, highest mold foods get sent to the US and then we drink our coffee or we drink our wine or we eat our grains and then we don't feel very good and our gut is off and it's just not a great day. It can be because of mold toxins. If you eliminate high mold foods like grains, nuts, legumes, and even alcohol, and you replace them with organic grass-fed beef and dairy, and you get high quality lab tested clean coffee, maybe even with added minerals, that would be really, really good for you. The difference in a bad cup of moldy coffee and a good cup of coffee is profound. You'll also find that glyphosate is in a lot of food, especially in the US and Canada. Glyphosate, also known as Roundup, is a toxin. It destroys soil and it accumulates in fat and neurological tissues it disrupts your gut microbiome and it's linked to cancer, in fact, in multiple lawsuits. Even worse, it modifies your mitochondrial membrane. This is an internal part of your cell that makes electricity and makes sex hormones. So we're poisoning ourselves with small amounts of glyphosate in our food, our energy production goes down, and then you just don't feel as good and everything feels hard. Your job is to eat food that makes everything feel easy. Glyphosate also acts as an anti-nutrient because it binds to essential minerals that your body needed. So the plants are already doing that to you. We're adding glyphosate to them so that when you eat that wheat that was sprayed with glyphosate, you're losing even more minerals. And as I mentioned, it does kill bacteria in topsoil. And unfortunately, it also kills earthworms. So you really wanna choose organic food. You wanna avoid grains, especially in the US, because even organic grains now can have high levels of glyphosate. And this is because we're using so much of it that it gets into the water and gets recirculated. Wash your vegetables well, choose organic grass-fed, grass-finished beef because it has the lowest glyphosate. 
Another thing that's really going to change your brain function and make you fat is artificial additives like sweeteners. They disrupt your gut bacteria. Things like sucralose, things like NutraSweet or aspartame. They are provably bad for you and there's no reason to eat them because there are natural things like monk fruit that work just fine that don't do that. Artificial colorings are linked to brain problems, especially in kids. There's no reason to use fake colors except that they're cheap. It's not worth trading off your ability to focus and pay attention to have a special color in a food. Artificial flavors almost universally disrupt systems in the body. You don't want them. MSG, even when it's not labeled as MSG on a label, will cause food cravings after a meal. And the reason for that is that MSG causes your neurons to fire and too much glutamate, which is the G in MSG, will overexcite your neurons even to the point that some of your brain neurons can die. And how do you know if it's MSG? Well, MSG has about 75 different code words, but if it says natural flavorings or spice extracts, there's MSG in it, even if they don't tell you. So more grass-fed animals, less bad oils, less chemicals, and the right kinds of starch. But how do you know how much of this to eat? Well, when you follow this type of diet, your body will naturally regulate your hunger. There is no benefit to counting calories at all. Here's proof. When I was creating the Bulletproof Diet, I wanted to just disrupt this idea that calories in and calories out made a difference. So I said I was gonna eat 4,000 calories a day, I was gonna stop exercising, and I was gonna limit my sleep to five hours a night, and I was only going to do it for a month. And for that month, I thought I would maybe gain two or three pounds, but the math would say I should gain a lot more, and I was gonna talk about how different calories do different things. I lost weight, and I kept doing it for more than a year, and I grew abs, which is completely ridiculous. It's not good for you to overeat, but what I'm telling you is if you eat the right kinds of foods, you will regulate your hunger and it's very, very hard to gain weight. A cyclical keto diet is a really good idea if you're trying to lose weight. Now, unending keto trashes your thyroid because it lowers your T3 hormone. I've seen this over and over in men and women. You just go on the keto diet, including me, you feel really good, so then you decide you'll always be on it, and then after a while, things aren't good anymore. This is why I've been teaching for more than 10 years, go into ketosis, go out of ketosis, go in, go out. And this allows your body to stay in a lower stress level so you don't get a big spike in cortisol. You can become metabolically inflexible to the point where your cells don't handle carbohydrates very well if you never eat carbs. Before we called it that, I tried the carnivore diet and I went for three months on meat only, well, meat and coffee and I did not have enough carbs to maintain my gut lining. So what I ended up with was leaky gut, my sleep quality was dysregulated, my cortisol levels were too high, and it took me a while to recover from that. This is why I highly recommend that you schedule a carb up a few days a week. And if you're an athlete training heavy or a woman, you might need to have carbs twice a week, even though you're lower carb on the other days. And you might do a week of ketosis, but don't do months of ketosis because it will break you. So keto is like a scalpel. You don't want to use it all the time. But most important of all this, you've got to find your personal kryptonite. Not all people respond the same way to all foods. So you may be sitting there and your husband or your wife they can eat something and when you eat it, like, wow, I, I get inflammation, I get muffin top, I'm bloated, my brain doesn't work. It doesn't mean that the food is good or bad, it means it was compatible with you or not compatible with you. When you're doing the elimination diet, you wanna eat only green zone foods for two weeks. And you can download the diet for free, go to daveasprey.com roadmap. And what that'll do is tell you everything on one page, good proteins, bad proteins, good carbs, bad carbs, just eat from the top of it and at the end of two weeks, see how you feel. And you might feel amazing. Then you can add some foods back. And when you add those foods back in, you can test your pulse to see if you're allergic to them. So you get your pulse when you wake up or even a pulse before a meal. Usually your watch will do that these days. And then 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 90 minutes after a meal, take your heart rate. If it goes up by 17 beats a minute, you were sensitive to something in the meal that you just had. You can also get blood tests. There are other ways of doing this, but seriously, two weeks of eating super clean, limited, just to get rid of all the suspects. See how your brain works, see how you feel, see how you look, see how your pants fit. 
you might be amazed to realize something that you enjoy is really not good for you. So you wanna find something else you enjoy even more that makes you feel amazing. The best test of all though, is when you wake up in the morning, is your brain turned on? Are your joints stiff? Does your back hurt? Do you feel like crawling out of bed or jumping out of bed? When you dial your food in at lunch and dinner the day before, when you wake up, your body feels amazing. By now, you might have noticed that a lot of the foods that advertisers have told you are healthy, things like plant-based, which is another word for highly processed, uh, things like plant-based oils, those are not doing you any favors. And if you look around, we have more obesity on the planet than we ever have before, and we're eating less meat than ever before. There are thousands, actually tens of thousands of studies looking at protein quality, and the reality is that when you add more animal-based protein and animal-based fats to your diet, you will be healthier. There's an orchestrated campaign to convince you to give those up, and when you do it, reliably, you lose muscles, you lose bone density, and you become a weaker human being. My job is to teach you how to eat the foods that give you so much energy that at the end of the day, you still have some left over. So you can use that energy to upgrade yourself, to transform yourself. That's why eating is important. It's about how much energy you have to bring to the world. It's not about how you look. You will lose weight as a side effect if you need to lose weight, if you eat to have maximum energy. And it is so liberating having lost the 100 pounds myself, but more importantly, having turned my brain back on, your brain requires energy. And if your body is hoarding energy by storing fat because you're giving it toxins, because you're eating the wrong stuff for you, then of course your brain isn't gonna have all the energy you wanna have. So I want you to feel amazing all the time. That's why this is such an important episode for you. I'm Dave Asprey, and this is Biohacking.